tonight missing in Maui. The grim search and surging death toll in Hawaii's wildfire wasteland. A traumatic return to smoldering rubble. Nobody really knows until they can make it in here whether their houses are standing or not. And the harrowing stories of survival. Myself, my wife, and our five kids, we all got in the ocean. Rent prices reach a new record high. All the other added expenses that come with living in an apartment too, it all adds up. Ballooning costs and Canadians feeling the strain. Plus the high tech hunt for a mythical creature. But we've had to add more locations from the amount of volunteers we've got. Looking for the Loch Ness Monster, the biggest search in a half a century. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Heather Butts. Good evening. A tragic reality is setting in tonight after wildfires raced across Hawaii. The death toll from the catastrophic fire rising to at least 67. A look at Maui from the air as flames lit up the night sky, burning buildings, illuminating the smoke rising above. The number of people unaccounted for remains elusive tonight as family members search for loved ones. Officials acknowledge the death toll will grow. I do not know what the final number is going to be, um, and, and, and it's going to be horrible and tragic when we get that number. People's homes and livelihoods gone, once a tourist destination, now unrecognizable. And as flames swallowed the island, survivors made daring escapes. CTV's Melanie Nagy with those stories. This is downtown Front Street. Haunting video from what was historic Lahaina reveals a cluster of charred cars. Vehicles, people were driving in a desperate attempt to escape one of Maui's monstrous fires. I absconded my friend's bike. Emerson Timmons filmed the devastation while riding a bicycle in an attempt to reunite with his family. Harbor, walkway, what used to be. As he moved through his annihilated hometown. Everything used to be here. It is no more. He shared his sobering observations. The people were stuck in those cars trying to get out and they had to run for their lives. And I had to get back to my family because there's fires breaking out elsewhere. The Maui wildfires and the ones on Hawaii's Big Island are now collectively considered one of the worst disasters in state history. Dozens of people have been killed and an estimated 1,000 are unaccounted for. There's still people missing. Keith Hunter has called Maui home for decades. Not all of his friends have been found and he's overwhelmed by the destruction. I've never seen something ravaged so fast. The quick moving and frightening fires forced thousands to flee including this California man, his wife and five children. The family was having dinner in Lahaina when flames ripped through the town. He says they had no choice but to plunge into the ocean. We found a floating board that we hung on to. Everything we were out there floating, and this is so surreal. While hot ash rained down on them, they struggled to stay afloat. The ocean almost sucked my kids away a few times. After three hours at sea, they were rescued by a fire crew. We're not going to die this way. No. And then we, we're here. We're alive. So many harrowing stories of survival. Every road that we went down was blocked. Including Ontario's Jesse Watkins escape from the fire zone. When disaster struck, she navigated a treacherous road to Maui's main airport. We had a convertible. I don't know how it didn't catch on fire. Early this morning, Watkins landed safely in B.C. Just beyond grateful to be home. Yeah. Global Affairs Canada says it's working with people to help them return home. The agency also says so far there's no reports of any Canadians killed or injured. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Serious questions are being raised tonight about Hawaii's emergency alert system. No warning sirens were reportedly sounded before people raced to flee the wildfires. This, despite state claims, Hawaii has the largest hazard warning system in the world. Many evacuees say they only realized their lives were in danger when they saw flames or heard explosions. More on the plight of the survivors now from ABC's Melissa Adan in Maui. We are here reporting from Western Maui where we've been meeting with countless, countless people who have gone through 
utter devastation. So many of them sharing with us their sense of sadness, the frustration that they're dealing with, but also showing us just such incredible resiliency. That's something that's really echoed here by the people of Maui. One woman that we met with, Absidy Rosa, actually was out here volunteering, handing out water to others who were waiting for some answers. When we started chatting with her, she shared with us that she herself lost her home. She had found that out through a social media video. She has not yet been able to access her home because we're right by a blockade right now that emergency personnel are the only ones that are able to go in and out or only people that are evacuating are able to leave. So in that, it has been a really tough situation for the people here, but on an update there with the firefighting efforts, firefighters close to containing all three fires that have been ravaging the island of Maui. Reporting here from Maui for CTV News, I'm Melissa Adan. Here in Canada, federal officials say scorching summer flames could stretch the wildfire season. There are currently more than 1,100 wildfires burning across the country, with over 130,000 square kilometers of earth burned so far this year. The endless firefight has prompted Ottawa to fund a new training program protecting communities near the front lines. CTV's Alyssa Thibault reports. From BC to Nova Scotia, 2023 is continuing to prove a record year for Canadian wildfires. And it's only August. This year's already devastating season is not yet over. Natural Resources Canada says in terms of area burned across the country, 2023 is far above the previous record set in 1989 and more than six times the yearly average. Officials say the combined perimeter of all fires this year would stretch almost the entire length of the equator. The science is very clear here. The root cause of this is climate change. To help in the firefight, federal ministers today announced funding for a new pilot program, $400,000 to train municipal firefighters in structure protection for communities where homes are built near potential wildfire fuel. With virtually every province impacted by fire this year, Canada needs more resources than ever before. We need to continue to strengthen our wildfire uh, fighting capacity. Uh, and increase our flexibility with the firefighting resources that we have. This training is, is developed and designed for, for municipal firefighters to protect their communities uh, on an initial uh, first response basis. The new training will add to the already major response effort. This year, Canada has deployed more than 5,800 domestic firefighters with the help of nearly 5,000 international personnel from 12 countries. And the community impact is significant. Four firefighters have died on the job this year and more than 160,000 people have been evacuated from their home. Experts say this fire season won't end until the fall for much of the country in BC. It could be winter. Alyssa Thibault, CTV News, Vancouver. Firefighters in Toronto will remain at the site of a massive industrial inferno for a few days after an explosion at a chemical distribution building. Ooh, let's get out of here. Yeah, we better go. Oh, wow. oh! More than 100 crew were fighting the flames at the height of the six alarm fire. Plumes of black smoke forced nearby businesses to be evacuated. No injuries have been reported and the cause of the fire is under investigation. Cleanup is underway in the nation's capital a day after a severe storm pummeled the city with torrential rains and flash flooding. Sump pumps were in overdrive today. The full scope of the damage from yesterday's storm now clear. Ottawa residents still recounting the tense moments when the floodwaters rose. We were uh, evacuated from the building completely. And by the time we got outside, I'd say I was like waist deep in water. Environment Canada says some parts of Ottawa received as much as 100 millimeters of rain. In a country struggling with a housing crisis, it may not come as a surprise. The average cost of rent in Canada just reached a staggering new high. CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier on the reasons why. About a third of Canadians live in rental units, and for those roughly 13 million people, life is getting pricier. I rent out just a single bedroom apartment. Um, and currently um, it's, it's expensive to rent out an apartment. 
A new report from Rentals.ca and research firm Urbanation found Canada hit a record for average rental prices last month, more than $2,000 per month for the first time. That's up by nearly 9% over the past year. It's obviously very expensive for everyone to live, especially in the city. I rent with two other people and um, it's one bathroom. Do you think you'd be able to afford rent on your own? Oh, absolutely not. That's why I'm renting with two other people. The highest prices are in Vancouver, where renting a typical one-bedroom apartment will cost you $3,000. And Toronto, where the same thing will set you back nearly $2,600 per month. The group behind the numbers says renters are facing a perfect storm, creating high demand. We've seen a significant period of population growth, high inflation, and a low production on housing. And this is going to create a burden on the rental housing market. More people search for rent, that'll drive up the prices. And this researcher on population growth says a big part of the problem is the current culture of buying houses and condos as investment properties, charging high rents and expecting value to increase quickly. We can't solve this housing crisis until Canadians adopt the principle of homes first, investment second. And Rentals.ca says part of the solution is a focus on building more rental units to drive demand down. We're looking at a huge increase of what we need. And then until that happens, the prices are going to be what they are. Another factor behind this big boost in demand for apartments, according to the report, is rising interest rates, prompting many Canadians who want to buy to stay in the rental market for now. Heather. CTV's Bill Fortier. Building more homes is one solution to the housing crisis, but a move to build in the wetlands and farmland of Ontario's Greenbelt has created a scandal for Doug Ford's government. The Premier was forced to justify the decision again today after the province's Auditor General declared certain developers were given preferential treatment. CTV's Allison Hurst reports. Hammered by questions about the Auditor General's scathing report that dug into the handling of opening up parts of the Greenbelt at an announcement, Housing Minister Steve Clark and Premier Doug Ford were once again on the defensive. I've admitted numerous times the process could be a lot better. The Premier and I and our government have, have completely acknowledged the fact that uh, we moved too fast and there were uh, severe flaws in the process. They were pressed on the reason why they wouldn't reevaluate the decision the report says favoured certain developers and why they insisted on building the Greenbelt land, despite the fact their own task force says it's not necessary in order to reach the government's housing goal. No one had preferential treatment. Uh, what we're doing is trying to build the 50,000 homes uh, for people that, that need it. Ontario's official opposition is demanding the legislature be recalled immediately to fully address the report. The decisions that were made, questionably, need to be put on hold, and that's the primary focus of bringing the house back. The recall would focus primarily on claims that the decision on land removal was spearheaded by the housing minister's chief of staff. According to the report, 92% of the land removed was requested by developers he had dinner with in September. This wasn't a leak. <laughs> this, this was, uh, it, when I read the Auditor General's report, basically direct influence. Ford and Clark maintained they were unaware of what was going on. These people continue to peddle a lie. And they use that in order to enrich some of their friends. David Crombie was the chair of Ontario's Greenbelt Council until 2020. And he says the Auditor General's report confirms why he and other members resigned their seats. We could see what they were doing with the, all the processes and policies and pieces of legislation that go up to make the planning public, public planning process in Ontario, right? And they distorted it. The Integrity Commissioner's investigation is still underway. Allison Hurst, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up, a banner moment for the Blue Jays. Uh, a lot of great memories, a lot of great relationships. Honoring a bat-flipping superstar. Plus, Go Charlie, it's your birthday. Hip Hop turns 50. This jam is amplified, so just glide. glide. Looking at your backbone, slide. slide. One of the best Toronto Blue Jays of all time returned to the place where his career took off. All-star slugger Jose Batista, forever linked to that famous playoff bat flip, signed a one-day contract so he could officially retire as a Jay. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on the start of the celebrations. His prolific power propelled him to greatness. You'll be talking about where you were when it happened. Sparking a baseball renaissance across Canada. Don't tell while he didn't end his career in Toronto, Jose Batista has finally returned home. 
arriving at the ballpark with his wife and four daughters. This is a way to make it official. Putting pen to paper, signing a one-day contract. Do you get paid for that one day? I don't know. Maybe we have to ask uh, Mark. Truth is, today's ceremonial signing is priceless, with Joey Bats officially retiring and walking off a Toronto Blue Jay as he reflects on his time playing for an entire country. The energy and the love of fans across the nation, it was huge. Uh, it still is to this day. Batista holds the franchise record with 54 home runs in a single season, hitting 288 bombs during his tenure with the club. His most memorable coming in Game 5 of the 2015 American League Division Series. Here's Bautista. Game tied at three, seventh inning, runners at the corners, two outs. The bat flip. You hit that home run. Fans across the country blackout. I mean, I blacked out because I truly don't remember what happened after uh, I hit the ball. I don't even remember flipping the bat. It was uh, just a pure moment of bliss and, and enjoyment and ecstasy and celebration. You know, the stadium felt like it was shaking. Remember best for his on-field heroics, Batista's arrival put a floundering franchise back on the big league map. You know, he was a fan favorite for a reason. This guy wasn't just a guy that put up numbers. He did it with a little bit of pizzazz. Is it possible that this franchise isn't in the place it is today without Jose Batista? I think it's entirely possible. Completely rejuvenated baseball in this city and this country. This weekend, Batista will have his name added to the level of excellence inside Rogers Center, where he'll rightfully take his place amongst the greatest Blue Jays of all time. Does it feel like you're home? It does. I'm glad to be back. Batista notes that while he cherishes his career highlights inside this ballpark, his most memorable moments are the relationships he made on this field, in this city, and across the country. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. At Yankee Stadium in New York tonight, there was another celebration of the past, a star-studded concert marking the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. <laughs> Earlier, Chuck D and Flavor Flav of Public Enemy held a free concert in the Bronx. People that think hip hop is not going to go another 50 years, it's called Don't Believe the Hype. That's right. It was August 11th, 1973, when DJ Cool Herc became the first person to mix the same record on two turntables at a party in the Bronx, and hip hop was born. This jam is amplified, so just glide. glide. Let your backbone slide. slide. Toronto's Maestro Fresh West was another pioneer in the genre that over time has become one of the most popular in the world. Still ahead, paddling for their pride. There's no sinking hope during this incredible feat of human willpower. We have dramatic video to show you tonight of an arrest by Montreal police. CTV's Mac Grillo reports. It's five o'clock on Wednesday afternoon matter of moments, the situation escalates. Police say it all started with a tip that somebody was being held against their will. The police at this time was fearing for his safety. On scene, two officers noticed the alleged victim, a 30-year-old man, was inside a car. The car sped away but crashed a few seconds later. Two people were arrested. Celia Medcourt and Ben Terry Edouard are both 19 years old and facing a long list of charges, including sexual assault with a weapon, extortion, assault with a weapon, and uttering threats. This arrest was recorded by Justin Tremblay, who happened to be relaxing on his balcony. One of the two cops said something like, it's them, and then it really, you know, it escalated almost instantaneously. So he started to take video on his phone. Didn't think much of it, but when they took off, I was like, oh, really? They're taking off? What? Despite how intense the police operation was, Tremblay saw officers react quickly. This is a good job, really. Like, hats off to the cops, really. They did a fantastic job. They didn't go very far. Nobody was hurt. After both alleged suspects were arrested, police entered the apartment. They went inside to make sure that everybody was safe, and after that, they, uh, they had a warrant to go inside and uh, try to, to find some evidence. The two arrested remain detained. The victim was sent to hospital because police say he suffered injuries all over his body. Matt Grillo, CTV News, Montreal. The world has seen the resolve of the Ukrainian people since the war began. Today, there was another example of it in an athletic competition far from the front lines. 
This was Team Ukraine at the World Dragon Boat Racing Championships in Thailand. Despite being fully submerged, the team paddled on for two kilometers until they reached the finish line. Talk about unsingable team spirit. After the break. Do you believe the Loch Ness Monster exists? I think there's something there, yeah. The explorer looking to put an end to the great debate. Tourists have long flocked to Loch Ness in Scotland, hoping to catch a glimpse of the rumored marine creature. Now a massive search for Nessie is about to get underway, the largest in more than 50 years. CTV's Vanessa Lee takes a deep dive into what may lurk beneath the surface. For generations, this freshwater lock in the Scottish Highlands has been home to one of the world's most enduring mysteries. Is there actually a monster lurking beneath the waves? Depends who you ask. Do you believe the Loch Ness Monster exists? I think there's something there, yeah. I don't know what. I don't know what we're looking for. Monster hunters like Alan McKenna are gearing up for the largest surface search since the 1970s. Obsessed with Nessie since he was a little boy. My first book that I read was Tim Dinsdale's The Story of the Loch Ness Monster. That's what got me hooked into it. And then I read as much as I possibly could. I watched as many documentaries as I possibly could. The first modern day sighting was 90 years ago when a hotel manager says she spotted a beast in the water, kickstarting a frenzy that has spawned hoaxes and at least a thousand eyewitness accounts. People want to believe in legends and, you know, we all need a little bit of magic in our life. So far, around 200 volunteers have signed up to keep an eye out for any unusual movements. We are also using uh, hydrophones, which will allow us to actually listen under the loch and uh, thermal uh, imaging drones uh, over the night to try to get a better view. At 37 kilometers long and one and a half kilometers wide, the sheer size of the lake makes it a monstrous task. It's just shy of 800 feet deep and it's a needle in a haystack and there's, there's webcams up there, there's eyes on the lock at all times. But if I'm looking in this direction, it only takes two seconds for something to pop up in that direction and you can miss it completely. Nessie or nonsense, those who have been to Loch Ness say it's hard to look away just in case an elusive creature decides to make an appearance. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. That is our show for this Friday night. I'm Heather Butts. For Omar and all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Sandy will be here tomorrow. Good night and have a great weekend.